Welcome to the More Liberty Now podcast. Get what you want out of life. This is episode one. My co-host is John Tyner and I'm George Donnelly. Our topic today is Why Voluntary Matters. If you like the show, subscribe at morelibertynow.com slash subscribe. What does voluntary mean? According to Merriam-Webster, the first definition of voluntary is done or given because you want to, and not because you are forced to. Done or given by choice. This is the definition we are talking about today. Voluntary things are things you do because you want to, because it makes you happy, because you have decided it is the best way forward for you that it suits your self-interest or aligns with your principles. Is it voluntary? This is a question we rarely ask ourselves these days. It's more common to ask, do I have to? But it's a question we need to ask ourselves more often, not just in political contexts, but in our personal lives as well. Ask yourself, do I really want to? And if not, then perhaps you should be making plans to get that activity out of your life. Life is short, after all, and time is our most scarce resource. Why does voluntary matter? You are a sovereign and independent human being capable of making the choices for your life and taking responsibility for those choices no matter the outcome. Who is better qualified than you to make decisions for your life? No one. Why are you the best qualified to make decisions for your life? Because you reap the benefits or suffer the consequences of your decisions. This direct connection between action and consequences is accountability. You are directly accountable for your actions. This enables you to learn from your decisions and make better ones in the future. Is it voluntary or coerced? The question boils down to control. Who controls you? Are you in control? Do you make the decisions and carry the responsibility for them? Or is someone else dictating to you how to live your life? Is someone else in control of your life? If they are, then you need to give serious thought to getting that person out of your life. So what? What's the big deal about things being voluntary or not? If you're in control of your life, if you're living a voluntary life, then you chart your course. You reap the benefits of your good decisions and pay the cost of your bad decisions. But if someone else is in control of your life, how can you be sure that they value your life as much as you do? You only get one life after all. When someone else is in control of your life, they don't bear the cost of the mistakes that happen in your life. You do. So there's no incentive for this controlling party to be responsible and careful with your life, your liberty, or your property. The connection between action and consequences is broken, and there is no accountability. In other words, either your life is voluntary, or it's a plaything for someone else. This someone else is probably profiting from you without assuming the risks. You assume the risks and you suffer, but you're deprived of the upside. In fact, because of the inherent inefficiencies of control, it's likely that everyone is suffering from involuntary situations. In the personal sphere, involuntary actions often often happen between parents and children. Examples include child abuse, punishments for children, telling a child what to do in a non-emergency situation instead of negotiating with the child. However, intimidation, bullying, domestic abuse, fraud, lying, deceit, and outright physical aggression, violence that is not provoked, are also examples of coercion in the private sphere. There are many more examples of involuntary actions in the public sphere of life, including compulsory schooling, taxation, laws and regulations promulgated by governments, war and other military actions such as drone strikes, government courts, government police, Federal Reserve notes, that is, U.S. dollars, especially government actions that devalue its purchasing power and attempts to quash competing currencies, such as the Liberty Dollar. The corresponding alternatives to these involuntary actions are unschooling and homeschooling instead of compulsory government and private schooling, donations to free trade, donations and free trade instead of taxation, private contracts such as rental agreements, terms of service, purchasing food at the supermarket and buying something on Amazon instead of government laws, negotiation and nonviolence instead of military action, mediation and arbitration instead of government courts, private security instead of government police, 
Bitcoin and silver and gold coins instead of Federal Reserve notes. Will life as we know it fall apart without forcing people to do what we want on a daily basis? No. We are inherently and ultimately reasonable people. We can use voluntary agreements to achieve all of the ends we seek when we force other people uh, to do what we think is best for them. In fact, by banishing coercion and insisting on only voluntary relationships, we can bring peace where there is conflict, achieve more together, and honor human dignity across the globe. A voluntary world can and does work, and it's a bright and promising goal that humankind must assign a high priority to in the 21st century if we wish to realize our potential and build a better world for ourselves and the coming generations. For every episode, we create a downloadable resource to help you implement these ideas in your own life. Get the downloadable resource for this episode at morelibertynow.com slash one. That's the number one. Got a question about the More Liberty Now podcast? Tweet at More Liberty Now or with hashtag More Liberty Now. You can also send an email to questions at morelibertynow.com. We love the hard questions, so don't hold back. All right, John. So, what do you what do you think? It's it's just feel it's a little awkward reading off of something and then like you know trying to read and looking at the camera and. Yeah, I just gave up looking at the camera while we were reading. <laughs> I tried to organize it <laughs> yeah, so I like could that. do both, but but I, I couldn't. Yeah, and I, I think that's the main reason I flubbed that one line too, is I was trying to kind of read it and then look at the camera and. Yeah, yeah. Ah, next time, next time, yeah. See, uh, listeners, I I I just kind of hacked together that script uh, last night. I didn't really give John time to to edit it properly or, or practice or anything, so. So that's, uh, I'll, that's I'll, I'll take it. I'll take. I'll. I'll take some blame for mismanaging my time a little bit and not getting to it sooner. No, no, no. no. I, I, my, my, my plan is to have scripts to you at least, at least three or four, hopefully a week. You know, three or four days or a week ahead of time. You know, because it's, you know, it's when you really, you know, sit back and think about it and edit it a few times that the real gold comes out. I think. Yeah. Um. I hope so. <laughs> time will tell. <laughs> So, so what do you what do you think? I think uh, maybe one of the controversial things was um, uh, like punishments for kids. You know. Yeah, that's, that, that's the that's the biggest one. That's the biggest one for me. My little ones are two and four now, and they like to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah, I could sense that so when I, you were I, reading I it. Say, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say. I will say the the four year. Years my son's been alive, and the two years I've never spanked either one of them, so I'm kind of proud of that. And they don't seem to be turning out to be bad kids at all. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, there are some people who stress over, you know, like their kids are going to turn out bad, or like they're like, you know, when they when they be I gotta be hard on them now because when they're teenagers, they're just going to fly out of control. I've heard people, you know, say this to me. And uh, I just think that as long as there's love there, you know, and there's trust, uh, as long as the children feel they can trust their parents, I, d I don't think you really have to worry about it, you know. Like I I've seen relationships where the kids just don't even trust their parents. Like they just see the parent as like a, like a, I don't know, like a person giving them orders, and they're they don't. And you know, it's you see that in that thing where like the parent says, uh, the dad says it even, well, how was school today, son? And the son was like, eh, meh, you know, and doesn't answer. It doesn't say anything. Doesn't tell his parents anything, you know. And I right. think that's a lack of trust. But I think where there is trust, I don't, I don't think, I think everything will turn out okay. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, your your son's older than my my kids are, so I mean, you probably have a little more experience with it, you know. Like my kids. You know, I tell them, hey, like, you forgot to turn the light off in the bathroom kind of stuff, or, you know, you forgot to flush the toilet. I mean, they're little. They do stuff like that still, and so I don't, my son goes to preschool, but I don't really get a whole lot of, I don't get a whole lot of interaction like what you're talking about, but I think it's mainly because he's four years old. You know, he comes mm -hmm. home, and I'm like, what did you do at school today? And he's like, I ran around, and then he's, you know, his attention span's gone, and he's off, you know, wants to go do something else. 
True, true. Right. Yeah, no, my son's eight, and he still forgets to flush the toilet and turn out the light in the bathroom. So. <laughs> oh, so that problem doesn't go away, huh? <laughs> Not anytime soon. So uh, there's been a, um, you know, you, I think we both know of uh, Stefan Molyneux, and there's been some controversy lately regarding him, which I, I don't really want to get into that much, except the topic of defooing, yeah? And I think... No, uh, what is this? I, I saw this term, but I have no idea what it is. I've never even heard it before. So let's see. I, I, I actually prepared. I actually prepared. So Urban Dictionary says, defooing is cutting ties with your family of origin. The family with whom you grew up without having much of a choice often involves moving out without telling them, telling the family. So the foo is family of origin then. So yes. Defooing. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you, what do you, so he, he's caught a lot of heat from this because apparently people feel like when they call him on his show or whatever that he says, yes, you should, you know, leave your family, and uh, and and a lot of parents are upset about this. Parents who've been on the receiving end of deep foods. Well, I guess I guess my first question is who who is he telling this to? I mean, is he telling it to seventeen and eight year old kids, or is he telling it to? I mean, I don't know who calls into Stefan's show. I've never never watched it or seen it. So I mean, at seventeen or eighteen, I'm not sure that you know Stefan's a big influence in these kids' lives. If they want to cut ties and move out, they're kind of old enough to do that, right? Hmm. Yeah. And actually, uh, when I was seventeen, I de food. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't think of it at, like that at the time. But I left my 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 dad's house when I was 17, and like I haven't looked back. And I think it was one of the best decisions I made. Um, so I, I think there's definitely a place for defooing, you know. And that that's an example of you know being like you know, hey, this this relationship is not voluntary, you know, because there was a lot of uh, it was quite an unpleasant uh, relationship, and uh, I'm done with it. I'm cutting it out, you know. And uh, it was a pretty good decision, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact terms of your situation, but defooing sounds like a pretty extreme. Um, ah, I don't know what the word I'm thinking of, but I mean, it seems like a pretty extreme reaction to whatever's going on. So I mean, it seems like things would either have to be pretty bad, or you know, it seems like at 17, 18, you could kind of move out. You don't necessarily need to cut those people out of your lives necessarily, but at least give them a smaller role. Although, I mean, I just think. Your family plays a, a more important role in your life than some friend. You can just say, you know what, I don't care for you know you anymore, and we don't need to ever see each other again. Yeah, I think it is a is it a, it is a pretty serious thing. Um, were there were there any other things in the in you know in the first first part that found uh, controversial? Um, not really. I mean, it's. The, I think the Federal Reserve notes um, one. I mean, it's it's government fiat money, but at the same time, in a lot of cases, you're not required to use that. I mean, there's no reason you can't go give the guy at the supermarket seashells if he's willing to accept them. Mm. So, I mean, in 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 a lot of ways, I mean, I think the use of Federal Reserve notes is voluntary. Although. Um... You know, we they demand taxes, right? And you can only pay taxes in that. And one way or another, sure, but I mean, yeah, go ahead. Great. I was just gonna say, I, yeah, absolutely. If you have, but government is force. I mean, that's kind of the point. That's why we're here, right? I mean, if you go to the grocery store, it's a voluntary interaction. They don't care. Well, I take that back. They probably do want FRNs, but at the same time, you can go somewhere else if you want. You know, it's. The government comes to you and says, "Give us money, and by the way, pay us in our currency." Hmm. Although I think there is kind of a thing going on, you know, with the government corporate collusion, and so then, you know, like for example, uh, you know, how many big companies accept Bitcoin, right? I mean, the only one that comes to my mind is is Overstock. Uh, com, and that's definitely an iconoclastic uh, corporation. There, I think, you know, there that's not your average. Average business. Did did you yeah, hear about that? This regard, but I've read plenty of articles. I did, yeah, and I've, but I've read plenty of articles about people who've actually gone on business, not business trips, but like vacation trips, and been like, let's see if we can get everything for Bitcoin. So I mean, more and more places are accepting it. Uh, I mean, obviously you can, you're not going to pay your taxes in it or anything like that, but there's plenty of places that'll take it nowadays. It seems like. True, true. It's definitely definitely increasing. Yeah. 
Although, and another thing, I think, but I think another thing that's involuntary about FRNs, you know, at the point of actually purchasing, you know, sometimes, you know, I think at the point at the point of sale, you can say that it's, you know, there's a certain large percentage of it that's voluntary. It's not completely voluntary, I think, but there is a lot, you know, it's like eighty percent voluntary, you know, let's say, but. Um, at the point of like issuing and management of the money, you know the inflation, um, you know how they uh, they keep printing more money and so it devalues the purchasing power, things like that. That I think is a real uh, strong example of how kind of the monetary system of which you know the Federal Reserve note is kind of the the, the front piece. Um, I think that's that's a real strong example of how it's involuntary. And really, it's just a way for them to steal. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to defend the Federal Reserve note. I'm just saying that when you go to the store, you know, it's voluntary for you to pay enough RNs. I mean, if you're a good enough salesman, I'm sure you could get the guy behind the counter to take your 20 pieces of silver or whatever to buy your groceries. Well, yeah, there. I went when the Liberty Dollar was still going on. I read, um, you know, people like field reports. You know, people talking about how. They offered the Liberty Dollars, you know, the coins, the silver coins, they're on the spot. And sometimes the cashier would be like, yeah, we can't accept that, but I'll take them, you know. And they would buy them <laughs> and put their own cash into the till. Uh, nice, yeah. Yeah, especially if you can do some kind of arbitrage and actually make a little money on the side from that. That would be a pretty sweet deal if enough people were doing it. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, you and I are, are known a little bit for our airplane stuff. Um, did you see that stuff about the knee defenders? Oh yeah, the thing you jam into the seat? Yeah. To keep the seat from reclining? Yeah, yeah, they're like little devices. You can, I think you can actually lock them and you put them so that the seat in front of you on the airplane can't recline into you. Right, right, right. I, I read a couple, like two or three stories about that. It seemed like one guy got in trouble with it and then like a week later two more people tried it out. Yeah, some guy, some guy used it on the seat back in front of him, and the guy in front of him really wanted to recline, and they got into a fight about it on the plane, and they diverted the air, <laughs> diverted the whole flight over it. Um, yeah, I actually saw, I saw, I saw a later story about that, and it sounded, you know, everybody made it sound like the fight actually erupted over this thing, and I guess the guy that used it claims that. He used it, and when the person behind, in front of him tried to recline, he actually told them, this is what's going on. And the woman lost it and called the flight attendant over. And when the flight attendant got there, he pulled it out. And as soon as he did, the woman in front of him just jammed a seat back as hard as she could right into him. Oh. So then he shoved her seat back forward and jammed the thing back in there. <laughs> and that's when the fight started. Oh, man. Oh, you know, it's so funny how people fight over it. Such a little thing. I mean, I hate it when people recline into me. I hate airplanes in general, but I hate it when people recline yeah, me into too. me. But, I, you know, like, I don't think I would ever buy a knee defender and stick that in there because it's just, like, not worth it to get into a fight on a flight these days, you know? Yeah. It, well, it's so yeah, easy. You're, you're probably, Sorry, you're probably in a better situation than I am. I'm six foot one. <laughs> oh, I'm six foot one, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're the same height. You know, you know how it is to be crammed in there then. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, I once, I once took a, like a 14-hour flight from Chicago to, to Japan, to Osaka. Oh, that was horrible. Okay. In, in like these really tight Northwest airline seats. Ugh. Yeah, well, maybe that's why Northwest isn't around anymore. <laughs> good. <laughs> I didn't realize that's good. So there, there yeah, was an article. I with Delta a lot of years back. Oh, uh, okay. So there's an article I saw in uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarians by Matt Swalinski about the property rights of knee defender. And basically, some people are saying, like, um, like you know, you own the space, you know, temporarily own the space uh, that they recline into or that the person owns their seat, you know, that they were going to recline. Yeah. And so, like, who's, you know, who, like, according to libertarian theory, you know, who who do you think is right there? You know, like, well, how would you work out that puzzle? It sounds like that guy's just wrong. I mean, from what I understand, the uh, the airlines actually prohibit these things. Oh, like, do they're they? not necessarily illegal, but the airlines prohibit it. Yeah, that was one of the articles I read said that. So, like, technically it's part of your rent. 
final agreement that you don't use that. So, I mean, it seems like the problem's already solved itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was reading Zwolinski's article, and he didn't really come to a conclusion, and I thought um, exactly what you're saying. You know, it's the, the airline. That's the airline has to decide, you know, who, if, if that's going to be acceptable or not. Yeah, and it seems like a good way to solve the problem, too. I mean, if you can't answer the question, you know, who owns that space, the airline can just come in and be like, this is how it is. Yeah, yeah. Because, they, I mean, they are the ultimate owner. You know, they, they're the ones who have to make those kinds of decisions, I think. Yeah, and like I said, it's it's not, yeah, you don't really own that space, you know, in any real sense of the term. I mean, you're renting it. So, I mean, in a, in a somewhat, uh, you know, metaphorical sense, you own it, but there's somebody else who's actually got ultimate authority over that stuff. Yeah, and you know, it can, can be a, a, a limited ownership, you know, where they can say, well, you can do this with it, and you can do that with it, but you can't do that other thing. You know? Right, exactly. So I, I saw a, um, an interesting article on, maybe it was Coindesk or something, about uh, Bitcoin and uh, the crypto economy 2.0. Um, did you did you did you did you see that? Did you ha have a chance to glance I, at it? I did. Ha I did have a chance to read that one. It seemed like the the bulk of the article was talking about just the blockchain and the various things you can use that for. Yeah, yeah. It seems like the the article seems to be saying like Bitcoin, the the money, is just like like the leading edge of the iceberg, just the tip of the iceberg, and the blockchain technology behind it, uh, that you can do so many, you can actually, and you can, and then you can actually build it on the same Bitcoin um, blockchain, uh, that it has so many, um, so many things you can build on it. And actually there's a, a project called uh, BitNation, where they're aiming to um, build like, Free market governmental services uh, using that, you know, like um, uh, dispute resolution and uh, property title registry, things like that. So, yeah, for stuff like a property title registry, that seems like that could be an interesting non governmental, you know, way to keep track of that kind of stuff. I like that idea. The article that I had read talked about using it for like trading stocks and other assets and stuff like that. And they're like, this is going to, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread. It's going to be awesome. And I just, I don't see that being a, you know, widely used thing. I mean, sure, it's great. You cut out the middleman. You probably save people money when they trade stocks and that kind of thing. But I don't really see that as being, you know, the next quote unquote killer app. So, I mean, I was kind of disappointed in the article, but I hadn't heard anything about it being used for stuff like property management or, you know, property title registry. That actually strikes me as a really good idea and something that applies to a far greater number of people than does a stock letter. Hmm. Yeah, no, the article definitely had a little bit of hype to it. <laughs> but there's, uh, there is this one project I was looking at called uh, Open Bazaar, which is, I don't know, I'm still wrapping my head around this stuff. But it's basically you can set up um, like a peer-to-peer -peer online store kind of a thing and sell your wares uh, directly to other people uh, use, you know, accepting Bitcoin in payment. Um, and and that looked pretty interesting. Yeah, it's uh, that. But I mean, that that seems like it's interesting for its own sake to me. I mean, that doesn't necessarily seem like it's solving a problem for these people. I mean, one, their ledger is essentially going to be open and online for everybody to read, which they may or may not want. You know, I mean, it depends mm -hmm. on the kind of product that you're selling. So, I don't know that that really appeals to a lot of people. So, like I say. It seems like a lot of these projects, at least so far, are just kind of interesting for their own sake. I mean, whether they lead to something more useful in general, I think, remains to be seen in my mind. True, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and especially this kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff, you know, um, like I'm all in favor of peer-to-peer -peer and direct connection and direct trade and cutting out middlemen, but sometimes I think you need to go through a central authority in order for things to be at maximum efficiency, you know, and not to be completely chaotic, you know, for the, and, and to keep the signal to noise ratio in, in check. Yeah, my, my other concern about using this, the Bitcoin for this stuff is that, you know, Bitcoin's kind of got a built-in incentive for mining the, you know, keeping the blockchain going. Essentially, you're mining Bitcoins when you do that. 
you know, somebody's got to pay for the hardware that's going to manage this other stuff later on. So, I mean, if it's one guy who wants to sell his wares online, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to also buy a really fast computer that can keep his ledger up to date if he can just buy some crappy computer and put his stuff into Quicken for himself. You know, I'd, so that, that's that's kind of my concern with a lot of this stuff is who's going to pay to keep you know to keep the blockchain moving. You know that that's something that concerns me too because I, I have my I manage uh, a wallet you know I have a few different ones but I manage one on my computer you know with the the basic Bitcoin client and uh, every once in a while I open it up and it has to update and it even though I have um, <clears throat> a pretty good computer uh, it slows down my computer you know as it updates. And then I tend to lose power sometimes where I am, and so and this is not a laptop. And so, boom! I lost power. I boot it back up. Power comes back, and it says, "Oh, there's an error in you know synchronizing whatever, whatever." And we're just gonna ditch all the work we did before and start all over again from day one of it. <laughs> And I'm there for days, waiting for the thing to finish. You know, catching up. Oh, it just. Some, you know, it's so I'm like every time that happens, like I'm gonna go put it in block. You know, I'm gonna go put my Bitcoin in blockchain or something. But then I hear another story of somebody losing um, their Bitcoin. You know that they stored in an online wallet, which yeah, it's just horrible. Yeah, that's even worse. It sounds to me like you need to take a few satoshis and go buy yourself a UPS. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Although I, I, I bet UPS is um, generate a lot of heat. Uh, you can get small ones. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't think it's too bad. I mean, maybe you could stick it by your window or hang it, you know, drape it out the window a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have to think about that. Yeah. 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 I think once the batteries store up, I wouldn't think they generate a whole lot of heat. I mean, I never. I used to have a little one, and I never really noticed it. But I also don't live you know, south of the equator, so. Yeah, it can get pretty hot, especially in, the, in certain afternoons, I get the sun full on here, and the whole room heats up, oh, you know, and, and it's made, yeah, uh, the walls are made of like adobo, it's it's called, and so I think it, it retains the heat, you know. <laughs> it's probably yeah. good in the winter, though. What winter? <laughs> there is no winter. <laughs> winter is when it rains a little bit. That's every it, 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 it rains you know it rains a little bit and then everybody's like oh winter's here you know <laughs> it doesn't yeah, matter what I time I didn't think about that yeah. yeah I guess like I didn't think of that that close to the equator it's always the same season yeah well also because I'm in the mountains I'm at like like five thousand meters and so that that okay. it has a cooling effect you know that has a moderate way effect. up there yeah yeah. <gasps> Air is thin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anything else you want to uh, get in before we, uh, no, before we finish up? No, this was cool. I'm glad we got a chance to just kind of talk about some of this other stuff at the end here. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed this. I missed this. Yeah. We did the, the Art of Liberty podcast about 20 episodes last year. And uh, so this, I think both of us learned a, a lot from that about podcasting and all that stuff. So uh, the More Liberty Now podcast is just going to kick ass, I think. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Got a question about the More Liberty Now podcast? Tweet at More Liberty Now or with hashtag More Liberty Now. You can also send an email to questions at morelibertynow.com. We love the hard questions, so don't hold back. If you enjoy the More Liberty Now podcast, you can support us at morelibertynow.com slash support. Your support enables us to pay the bills, provide a higher quality podcast, and reach more people with our practical and inspiring messages of liberty. I'm George Donnelly. And I'm John Tyner. We'll see you next week. Get the downloadable resource for this episode at morelibertynow.com slash one, that's the number one.